Good morning, everybody. Uh, so I'm Rawad. Uh, I work in the theory team in Condela with Shane, Pierre Manuel, Luca, and uh, Boris. And what I'm interested in is the certification and error mitigation of near-term photonic devices. So this is what I do. I'm, I'm, I'm a research scientist and uh, I'm basically studying some sort of research uh, questions, uh, th theoretical questions. And so uh, before starting with, uh, with, with telling you about what I do, let's, uh, let's maybe start by the hook, which uh, kind of um, most people, I guess, uh, att are, are attracted to quantum computers for, this, for these, the following reasons. So one is that they can factor large integers in polynomial time. And so what this means to some people is that they can actually crack what is known as the RSA encryption, which is the basis of our crypto systems, uh, banks, uh, banks and uh, stuff, uh, secure bank transfers and stuff kind of rely uh, in one way or, or the other on this type of encryption. Uh, they can search through unstructured databases uh, in a way which is much, much faster than what classical algorithms can, can do. And they can also solve some relevant tasks for machine learning also faster than the best known classical algorithms. Um, so this is the hook, like they can do some really nice applications. But of course, there's a catch which, uh, um, I mean, which, which is sometimes failed to be mentioned is that these quantum computers need to be fault tolerant. And to be fault tolerant, uh, I mean, it's, it's a small word, but it usually means uh, you actually need a large number of qubits uh, to encode what is called the logical qubit. And this is a qubit which is capable of, of, of error correction. So uh, errors happen in quantum devices as they do in, in classical devices. And we need to find a way to correct them. Otherwise, your computation would be corrupted by these errors and, and would be meaningless. And so to do that in quantum computing, you need, you need a large number of, of, of qubits, which are the equivalent of, uh, of classical bits, with, although quantumly and with, uh, with a bit more properties. And these qubits need to be a very good quality to begin with. So you need a large number and they need to be very good quality. And on top of that, you can only correct uh, some uh, processes or like some uh, things this way. You, you actually need on top of this error correction to add what is called a state distillation, or which uh, introduces additional components which are needed in order to, to do a universal quantum computation, so to do any sort of quantum computation. And this is, is this also complicates things and adds a lot of uh, a lot of overhead to you, to, to your already uh, huge uh, resource resources. Um, so in summary, uh, it's it, like scaling up and getting a full fault tolerant quantum computer to solve interesting uh, and uh, indeed groundbreaking uh, things uh, is probably not, uh, not, we're not there yet technologically, but at least in Condela and using the photonic approach, we have a very promising way that we think we can, we can do this in, in the near future. And to, to those of you who are like more technical oriented, I'm talking about measurement based quantum computing with photons and also fusion gates. Um, so this seems to be a promising approach. But anyway, we're not there yet. What we have now in the lab, uh, and what we expect to like have, uh, I mean, what we expect to have for the next few years is what is called these NISC devices or like noisy intermediate scale quantum devices. So they're not a full a uh, fault tolerant quantum computer, they won't help you do Shor's algorithm or Grover's algorithm, which which breaks RS, uh, like RSA encryption and, and, and does all those nice things. But they can still be used for some uh, interesting things. And these interesting uh, algorithms uh, are what we call uh, variational quantum algorithms. So variational quantum algorithms are, are, are really, um, so they're, they're hybrid, they use a quantum computer and the classical optimizer. And there's this back and forth between quantum and classical in order to solve a given optimization problem. And there's really a lot of problems which you can solve this way. And most importantly are the problems in physics, like uh, finding the eigenvalues of, uh, of a given Hamiltonian, which can, which can help you determine the, the, the property, say like if you're studying a certain uh, solid, it can help you determine the properties and, and therefore like the fabrication and uh, what is needed to kind of enhance uh, the, the properties. Um, so you can, you, can do a bunch of, you can do a bunch of other stuff as well, but uh, so this is just one example. Um, 
what we have at Condella is is more like a photonic sort of uh, NISC device. And what a photonic sort of NISC device looks like is is the following. So it's composed of n single photons, which are so like Condella fabricates single photon sources. So these, in some sense, are like the bread and butter of our quantum devices. These n single photons. And then what we do is that we pass them through a linear optical circuit. And at the end of the linear optical circuit, you have a bunch of detectors. And really, you can do a lot of interesting things just with this simple setup, linear optical circuits, single photons, and detectors. So for example, in our paper where we introduced Percival, our like powerful linear optical quantum simulator, we show that we can actually use it to solve uh, differential equations. So differential equations pop up everywhere, like they're, uh, you can see them in, uh, in heat equations, uh, which, which are necessary, say, like for... Uh, for combustion and, and, and chemical reactions and, and stuff like that. So uh, yeah, and, and and other of course like in, in other places as well. So they're 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 a very useful thing. Like to be able to solve differential equations is a very useful thing. And so we we show that like these photonic NISC devices in principle can solve them. Um, so it's really important to find ways to characterize these photonic NISC devices. And genetic instances of these photonic NISC devices. So if we're just or what is called, or what are referred to usually as, as boson samplers. And so studying boson samplers and boson sampling in general could give you an idea about the performance of our photonic NISC devices. Uh, so this is what we, what, we, what we do, basically, or what we would like to do. Um, so just to, to, to recap a bit what boson sampling is. So boson sampling, you start out with the same setup as I explained uh, a bit earlier, this photonic NISC device. So single photons, linear optical circuit and detector. And you play the following game. So you input your single photons through a linear optical circuit and the phase shifters and the beam splitters are configured in a, in a certain way. And then you measure with your detectors the, the, the outputting single photons. And then you ask for the following question. Um, if I have a given configuration, S1, S2, until Sm, uh, so S1 means how many photons are at the first detector, S2 means how many are at the second detector, so on, what is the probability to observe such an outcome? Like an outcome where I have S1 photons in the first detector, S2 in the second, and Sm in the nth. And actually, you can show by pen and paper calculations that it is pro proportional, this probability is proportional to what is uh, called the permanent of a matrix. And so I'll explain a bit what a permanent is. Um, so a permanent, so if you consider this matrix M here, which is just like a two by two matrix, so a matrix is just a set of numbers arranged in a given way. And I would like to calculate the permanent. So let, let's do it together. So what I do is, first of all, I focus on A and I forget about B and C and what remains is D and I just multiply a and D, so that's the first element. Then I move on to B, and then I, I remove one column here and one row here, and I focus on the, what, what I'm left with is C, and I just multiply B and C. So it's really, you, 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 choose, like, you choose a given row, which is this guy, A, B, and then for every element of the row, you eliminate this row and this column, which corresponds to it, and you multiply by, by what is left. So here you get A, D plus B, C. Simple enough, right? But how about trying it with <laughs> this guy here? So it's it's not so simple anymore, is it? Because you have to like it's a it's a huge process to do it. Um, and in fact, it's believed to be very 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 hard to actually compute this object here. Um, and we have a word for it in computer science. It's called Sharpie hard. Um, and it is this exact reason, like is why, because the probabilities of boson samplers are given by permanents, and because permanents are really hard to compute, it is why boson sampling admits a quantum advantage. It does something quantumly, which a classical computer cannot do, and it is because of these permanents. Um, and so, of course, the boson sampling does a specific task, which is sampling, right? Because I'm just asking what is the probability of getting this guy. Um, but is this a useful task? And, and really, this is like the million dollar question. Can you use boson samplers and whatever statistics you get to get a useful and provable quantum advantage over a classical computer? So when I say quantum advantage, it means for a sp 
specific task, a quantum device is outperforming your classical device. And so in, in our Percival paper, we showed that you can use a boson sampler to do a useful task, which I told you about, differential equation solving, but we did not show that it has a provable advantage yet. So this is something we're currently researching and, 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 and I'm trying to understand. But before all this, there's like a fundamental issue, and this issue is noise. So in real life, like a perfect, so in theory on pen and paper, a boson sampler is perfect and you get the permanent and, and, and all is well and it's hard and you have a quantum advantage. In real life, actually, you have a lot of experimental errors which happen. So a photon can get lost. Photons can become distinguishable particles by picking up additional degrees of freedom. And uh, detectors can malfunction. So all of these we know for sure will kill any potential quantum advantage. So even before we prove that if there's a quantum advantage or not, having noise will 100% kill it. So what I'm looking at understanding now is basically three questions. How can we characterize the noise which is present in our device? And we did some first steps in our paper uh, on this. Uh, so in, in, our, in, a, in a certain paper, we introduced a certain metric which helps you partially answer this question. The second question is, what level of noise is acceptable for any potential quantum advantage? So if I'm an experimentalist, how much should I improve my hardware so that I am at least in a region where I'm in principle, I can get quantum advantage if it is available to begin with? And the third question is, how can we use techniques from what we know about quantum information and, uh, and quantum computing to correct the effects of these noise? And this is still ongoing work with, with some other members of the team. And that's it for me. Thanks very much uh, for listening and uh, welcome to Quandela. And I hope uh, I'm, I'm always available for, for chatting or, yeah, you can see me most of the day just scribbling uh, permanence on uh, pen and paper. So just feel free to come and ask me some questions if you like. Thanks very much.